I guess a year went by. Maddie never did get the feel for housekeeping, but she was worried Zena would send her away, so she kept trying. And Maddie got better. Spring came, then summer, and instead of getting sicker, she got better. Hello and welcome back to Book Versus Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi, everyone. Glad to be back. <laughs> um, it, is, it is Black History. We are behind an episode. Um, and I just want to say thank you, everybody, um, we, for being so patient with us. Um, just to be, I just want to, I, I don't want to go into it too much, um, but I just want to say we're all okay. <laughs> um, there was an accident, um, involving my family, but we are, we are all fine. Nobody was injured. Um, we just have a lot of like messy, icky, um, insurance kind of stuff <laughs> to deal with now, but I really appreciate how kind everybody has been um, like, you didn't even know like what was going on, but you know, you knew it was something. And I, I just really appreciate it because I was just saying to Marco before we got on here that Facebook is a cesspool. My neighbors on the neighbor Facebook page, not nearly as kind as our lovely folks are on our lovely book versus mu- movie community. So appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ironically, we're going to be talking about a book that covers an accident. I know. <laughs> but we was like, let's get that before this happened. Uh, and so, but anyway, we're going to be talking about a classic of American literature uh, and an incredible author that we've talked about before, but we're going to talk about her again because she it definitely bears repeating. We're going to be talking about Edith Wharton. But before that, if you're not a part of our amazing Facebook community, um, or if you want to meet other listeners of this podcast, interact with us, find us in other places. There's a few places where we are that you can come and hang out. Yeah, we're most interactive in our Facebook group, which is a private group. You do have to ask to join. And I want to thank Thad, Thaddeus Powell. He put up two posts, alphabetized them. One of those posts are the, the episodes we've covered before and the stuff that people... And then the other post is about ideas that people have, which we totally, totally appreciate. So that's the Book VS Movie Podcast group. You asked to join there. We're on Twitter and Instagram and threads, book versus and movie. And then we have an old timey email, book versus movie podcast, spelled it all out at gmail.com. We just got brand new stickers, Margo. I forgot to show you, but they're sparkly and they're very cute. I'll, what? I'll, I, I would send Yay! it out to you, but I can't send it to your house, can I? I know. I have to send you. <laughs> I'll send you where our mail is going. But anyway, <laughs> we when it comes to suggestions, we just ask for the, whatever the book is. And we've t- covered songs and plays and magazine articles, yada, yada, yada. It has to be something we can easily get in touch with. It can't be something we have to buy off of eBay. And the same goes for the movie. It really needs to be on a major streaming app. It just makes things easier for everybody and more equitable to everyone. So, But all of you that have given us your suggestions, and we've had some great people show up to the group lately and join and give us ideas, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Amazing ideas lately, yes. by the way. Wow. And and I also want to thank Thaddeus for, for making this list. It is, it is time-consuming. Much appreciated. I want to mention, if you really, really enjoy the show and you want to help, help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. That's right. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. This is our 10th year doing the show we show up every week. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Life goes by and Margo and I show up with each other every single week to put on the show. So we've put up for the two years previous to this episode, it's in the main feed. And some of the Christmas episodes are always going to be in the main feed because it's Christmas and, you know, whatever. But before that, we're putting everything on the Patreon wall. We have a couple of very affordable options. We really do use the movies just for the books and the movies and the streaming stuff. And we want to thank 
Annie and Mick for joining recently. Just to let you know, a couple of the podcasts that are on the wall that nobody can get except the Patreon people, The Phantom Toll Booth, Apocalypse Now, All the President's Men, Jolene, Dolly Parton, and The Princess and the Frog. Those all just went up on the Patreon wall. So all of you who did that, thank you. And we understand, you know, if money's tight and we can't commit to that, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I want to thank Pretty Little Liars is the best who gave us a five star review on iTunes. It really helps us find our people and especially just even hitting the stars just puts us in the better list for them to discover podcasts. And on Spotify, I want to thank Jimmy and Renee for leaving us reviews at Spotify. Thank you so much. And also, it warms our hearts. Yes, <laughs> it, it does. Really, it does. Wow. It's just a new- time to do that is amazing uh so much appreciated too and okay oh, edith wharton y'all okay <laughs> we talked Bring about up wikipedia edith wharton. page <laughs> i know uh several we talked about you some time ago we did age of innocence which is an amazing movie if you've never seen it um or read the book it is brilliant um it's a the the movie of Age of Innocence is a, a really really faithful adaptation of the classic Edith Wharton novel, um, which is an I mean, it's it, we all have to read it in school for a reason. It's it's such an incredible book. Um, so is Ethan Frome. Ethan Frome is something that is on a lot of lists. Um, but I have to say, like when we study these books in school, or at least you and I, our generation, that when we studied um, this stuff in American literature. We didn't really go into the phenomenon of Edith Wharton. Like, I didn't know almost anything about Edith Wharton except that she wrote those books until way, way, actually, until I was uh, in, in college studying art history, because, and we'll talk about that, about mm-hmm. her, um, her, her uh, impact on the world of design as well as, uh, as literature. That's your sweet spot. It was like art and history yeah. and design. That's like, that's all like Margo <laughs> makes her, her antennas. That's my go, world. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Edith Wharton was born Edith Jones, Newbold Jones in on January 24th, 1862, the Gilded Age. She grew up in a family that was very wealthy. Her father, they had money and her dad didn't need to actually work for a living, but they still had a budget. And for them, living on a budget was like after the Civil War here in the States, the family had to move to Europe for a couple of years because it was too hard to make a living in America, just living off of that. Anyway, she grew up over in the first like 10 years of her life. She was living in Europe. She learned all the languages for all the countries that they visited when they came, she's been 66 times she went on a, a ship overseas and back 66 okay 66 times she was now, 75 when she died now in so, the age of even during the age of like concord right. jet you know like is ridiculous but uh, to get on a ship and just go back and forth 66 times <laughs> she loved traveling like that was her jam. She loved art. She lo- and and the, she was a redhead. She wasn't a great beauty, but she was really smart and charming. But also, when she was young, she was kind of awkward. And the thing was, is that her dad encouraged her to learn about the arts and the sciences and and all, all the beautiful things in life, architecture. And she loved to read. But her mother was very much that you need to come out to society. You need to marry a society man. You need to marry well. And you writing books is not going to do that. That's going to turn men off. And the fact that she wrote 40, she published 40 things in 40 years. And we're talking novellas and short stories. And she wrote about design. She wrote about everything. It's just completely fascinating. She was married once. Um, Edward Robbins Wharton wasn't a fun marriage. She had several relationships with really notable people. She won the Pulitzer Prize, by the way, for fiction for the age of innocence. During World War Two, World War One, excuse me, this is after when she wrote Ethan Frome, but I think it's really important to talk about like, she spent a lot of time in Paris, she loved France. And she when the, the Great War hit, she actually went to the front lines, she and a friend were one of the only people they knew that had a car that could drive around 
France and England and offer help to people. And they helped they helped migrants and they helped people that were you know chasing being chased away from their country. She was at the front lines for all of this, and it's it's the compassion she had for people is incredible. She could have just have been. And a flighty socialite living off her, her, her family, by the way, you know, the expression, keeping up the Joneses, Mm -hmm. keeping up with the Joneses, um, meaning it's about like consumerism and, you know, always having to have the the newest, biggest, best, better, because you want to be better than your neighbors. Her family was the Joneses. (laughs) Like that's where that comes from. (laughs) That's who they were. And, um, and, and one of the things I think that, that, the public, the greater uh, reading public found so appealing about, because Edith Wharton, especially like Age of Innocence, where she's writing about the Gilded Age. And, it's, and right now we have that wonderful television series. It's, uh, it's very like, that's the world that we're talking about, that she is living in. And um, anybody would have been happy to marry her just for the money. Uh, you know, like mm-hmm. she, she it would, um, and that's sort of what happened. But, um, but she just, she and she wrote about that world. It, it, so the the right now we're, we've been talking a lot in the in the you know in pop culture about the Truman Capote and the Swans uh, mm-hmm. phenomenon, you know, of having this writer that's part of this elite world and then kind of turns on them and exposes them for who they are. That's kind of what she was doing. Um, although she sort of waited long enough so that, mm-hmm. you know, she wasn't actually ruining anybody's lives or anything. But anyway, so it, she gave the greater um, reading public a glimpse into this extremely rarefied and elite world. And um, and the age of innocence, if uh, just to kind of talk about it real briefly, um, it all takes place, you know, with the asters and, and all of that kind of kind of world um, where it's all strategic and people are marrying, you know, trying to make the best match money and, and um, society and rules and norms. And, um, and you have this, these, the, the major who is in love with this woman who's unconventional. She comes from Europe, um, their world, but not really. And they have this uh, rather steamy, extremely sexy um fling without ever i don't do they ever actually even touch no i don't i don't think they ever actually even like hold hands like skin to skin um and it's like the sexiest thing so um so anyway so she's known for that she's known for writing about these these very very wealthy elite and their their very real faults (laughs) And, and, um, and criticizing kind of that system. Um, but then you have Ethan Fromm. Right. And so, like I said, she was very compassionate to people and, and understood like how lucky she was and fortunate she was, the way she was raised and the opportunities that she was allowed. So she was in this bad marriage and she's kind of depressed. She has a, you know, she has a crush that's unrequ. No, they had their lovers for a while, but he's a confirmed bachelor and probably bisexual, and they're, it's just not going to happen. But she's in this unhappy relationship, and there's somebody like a, that's shining a light, but he's never available. This is like in a lot of her work. So Ethan Frome comes out in 1911. I don't think it's. I think it's a novella. It's. It's not a, a long read. And um, there's lots of people that do their own readings on YouTube. If you ever are interested, that's what I listen to a couple of times. But uh, just yeah, if you're in a sad mood, sometimes sad things help you in a sad mood. <laughs> you know, just to get you can contact. You know, get in touch with your feelings. You could say, at least I'm not Ethan Frome. <laughs> right. Or it could bum you out. So we're just going to say, like, yeah. this is not a story about people, like a rom-com. Like, they're going to find each other, and then they're going to embrace, and then the wind blows no. through their hair, it, and they're happy. No. Nope. It's not a bodice ripper. No. Nope. Um, it, it's not, um, no, it's not a, it's not a cozy uh, mystery. <laughs> New England <laughs> romance. No. There are uh, sleds and snow, but <laughs> it's very cold and icy, and we don't have the opulence and the the mink 
of, you know, like the age of innocence, you know, like in age of innocence, we have like these, um, like Edith Wharton does winter and it's such a, oh man, she, she really, she really paints such a, a rich, uh, mental image of, of winter in, on the East coast, um, as you know, so like in the in the Gilded Age, as I said, we have all these layers of fur and beaver and um, you know silk and you know the carriages and the blankets. Da, da. Um, Ethan, though, he's not of that world, um, and his winter is a very different, very very cold winter of very few pleasures. <laughs> The, this town itself is called Starkfield, so that gives you, I think, an idea. This is not going to be a happy-go-lucky. This is not like New Heart, like, oh, okay. you know, like where people are hanging out and trading quips. It's like, like um, what, what's the name of the town in It's a Wonderful Life in the in the alternate reality? Oh, Pottersville. Uh, Pottersville. It's like Pottersville, but without electricity. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's a it's a rustic existence. And it goes back and forth in time. Mm-hmm. And we will talk about the movie. And the funny thing about the movie is there's no trailer. I could not find a trailer for this movie. No. Anywhere. So, no. but we'll get to that. I mean, I think this yeah. is one of those early Miramax productions where they mm-hmm. took on a literary source. But anyway, so a, a, an unnamed narrator shows up in Starkfield and is basically kind of snowed in. He can't go to the ultimate destination he needs to be. So he has to stay in Starkfield for a while. And one day he's at the post office and a man comes in with a terrible limp and he looks beaten up by life and he doesn't talk to anybody. He looks terrible. <laughs> he looks like he's right. And he looks like he's, he looks like, like if you were just hanging out at the post office and this guy walks in, like it's uh, all the narrator who, who doesn't have a name, all the narrator can do to not be like, oh my God, what happened to you? Um, and he doesn't understand, or she actually, it's it's not really clear if it's, it's a man It's genderless, or woman, yeah. Right? Yeah. So this, sometimes I'm imagining it as a man and sometimes I'm imagining it as a woman. They're a man... Uh, uh, they're not only shocked at the appearance of this this poor person, but they're also shocked at that like nobody else seems to care that this human being is in this horrible, horrible state in your small community. What kind of monsters are you? That right. You, don't you care? Look at this guy. Um, so yeah, that's so that's how that's how we meet this guy. And, and he's so he's he's really curious about Ethan Frome, and that that's the man's name. And he's told different stories about Ethan, and also sometimes it goes to Ethan's point of view. And Ethan, like we see when we see him, it, it's, we're told about him. He looks older. He's bent over. He walks with a severe limp. He's not, and and you know that he lives with his wife and then uh, her cousin or something. And people, but people don't really know the full story. But they know they've been there for like over twenty years. And then Ethan comes into the picture, and he sa- and he says. I used to be into science and I used to, I was at college and I was studying science and electro, electric or whatever. And he was a technology for that time. And then his father was sick and then his mother was dying or vice versa, but he had to go That's home. Right. And, yeah. And he had to yeah. go home and take care of that person. And then when, uh, th- then this woman named Zena moved into their house to take care of his mother so he couldn't go to college, so he had to make whatever living he could. And then Zena was living in this house. And when the mother died, he was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be alone. And I can't afford to go to college. And there's a woman here, and she seems kind of nice. And she took care of my it, mom. It's all very understandable. Yeah. Um, He's lonely. And, he, you know, and again, they live in – it's a remote place. Right. It's not crawling with like new chicks swinging into town. You know? No, it's and not so, Boston. This yeah, is little he town. Knows, he knows her to be capable and smart and skilled and um, and compassionate to a certain degree because you know she's been t- caring for his mom this whole time, and so yeah, makes sense, especially for then. Yeah. So they get married and they're now running. So he's had to give up his his dreams of pursuing science to run the dwindling family farm 
it, it's not a big farm. It's like a what we what we now call a subsistence farm. You know, mm-hmm. he's just they're just making enough to survive, just just barely. Um, and he wanted to study engineering. He wanted to study like the next mm-hmm. technological breakthroughs that were going to happen. And instead, he's shoveling horseshit. He's you know just he's in Starkville. He's in Starkville, <laughs> you know, and they, and they go to church sometimes, and sometimes that church has a dance. Woo! And that's like the the big. And winters are very tough there. That's what you're you're led to understand. Are we? I, 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 now I'm getting mixed up with between one version is in New York and one version is in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah, um, it's cold. I spent Massachusetts winters. You have too. Yeah, I've never been so cold in my life. That is the coldest I've ever been was in Massachusetts. Because you're right by the so water. So cold you can't feel your face. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. I, I moved to Massachusetts. I moved there in the wintertime to go to college, to go to, uh, uh, where'd I go? Boston University. <laughs> and uh, from San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, my goodness, it was the coldest winter they'd ever, literally the coldest winter they'd ever had up until that point. I think they've surpassed it since then. But at that point, it was the coldest. And I remember going into a 7-Eleven. I was in a 7-Eleven. I prob- I'm sure I just went into bar- out of the cold. And this guy was standing in line with me. There was quite a long line. And or should say online, because that's how they say it there, standing mm-hmm. online with me. And um, his, his, as I'm about to be real gross, his was a torrent of snot. His face? Just like his nose was Ooh. dripping and dripping. But he couldn't feel his face. So he did not know that that was going on. And you know, we all could see it, but he couldn't, we, we couldn't feel our faces either. For all I know, that was going on on my face. Um, like that's how cold it is. <laughs> it's real cold. Um, and we were lucky enough to have a 7-Eleven. <laughs> Right. And if you think about then, like there are no cars, there's no buses to get around. You get around with your horse and a, uh-huh. and a carriage and you're lucky if the carriage is covered and can fight the wind. I mean, it's just constantly, it's just very, very cold. And over time, you know, he's married to Zena, and they never have kids. And then she becomes, and she's a little older than him. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. She's a little older and not long after their marriage, she starts to become sort of thickly she and starts to like need a lot of medical attention like she was she she was worn out from taking care of the mother and now she needs some me time so it's you know i work in 24 7 and all that stuff I'm, she was just like i'm just i'm sick i don't there's no cure i'm just sick i need to just rest and she depends on him to do everything for her and she and get, run the farm and run the farm and he gets resentful and he because it's not the life he wanted either. Like they both kind of resent one another. Like they've they've made this decision and then it turned out they're not very compatible. And she has this pickle dish it, and the symbolism. But she has this the one symbolism. symbolism. <laughs> she has a pickle dish that's in red symbol. And she's <laughs> and it's like this one thing she re- that they it's got for their wedding possession. Right. A red glass pickle dish and that reminds me uh uh la, la, la. when i it, it, back when i years and years ago when i worked at the met if you go into the um the american wing of the met there there are or at least there were in those days um galleries and galleries of american decorative arts and and american glass in particular so american glass of this so i remember they had like pickle dishes and re- and that kind of red glass that you can see, and it is it is very pretty. It oh, is it, a very I can see how if I lived in a in Starkville <laughs> in the winter yeah. time, uh, that pickle dish would could get super important to me. Yeah, it's um <laughs> like I take it out like for special occasions, and I put some pickles in there, and I feel fancy and feel better. They're resenting each other. It's wearing him out to take care of her. She just gets sicker and sicker and sicker, and so then she has this cousin Maddie, and she moves in. And she's young and she's pretty and she's fresh. Yeah, but something has happened. Something has happened. Maddie has somehow, Maddie or Maddie's family, I can't remember exactly. Maddie is sort of a black sheep Mm -hmm. in the family. 
and you know her part of the family is not is looked out very much looked down upon by even Zena, who's like a poor farmer's wife in Starkville. Um, she is above Maddie, um, and so she's doing the family a huge favor by allowing uh, Maddie to come and take care of her and live in their house, um, such as it is rent free. Yes, but she is very pretty and um, and kind, but. You know, not there. She has not been well equip- equipped for life. She doesn't have a lot. She can't really cook. She can't really clean. She's trying her best, but um, she's clumsy. She she's you know she's ta- trying to take care of Zena, but she kind of messes up a lot. And so you know, there's a lot of like, oh, daddy. <laughs> So yeah. Zena's not getting you what do she wants. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and she's very particular how, how she, but right. She's not really great at anything. She has to learn it as she goes. And then the young men in town notice there's a Maddie and she's cute and she can dance. Like that's, that's stuff she's good at socializing. And that's what she loves. And there's some guy in town that really likes her and she dances with him at a dance. And I don't know if Ethan was following her, but he was like, he watches her dance and he gets so jealous because the guys are all like, yeah, wow. He's there. To, he's there. to Cause again, it's winter time. It's cold. Um, and it's dark, you know, it gets dark early. And there's this dance. And so he's just there to take her home. So he's there with his uh, horse and cart, I guess. Um, and yeah, so he's he's showing up to pick her up at the dance. And he looks through the window and he sees her dancing with this guy. And she's so beautiful and um, and looks so lovely as she's dancing. And who's this guy? Right. <laughs> she's vivacious. Like she's, she's a sign of life. And he notices her. And then when she leaves... The guy that she's dancing with says, I'll take you home. And she goes, oh, no, no, Ethan's going to take me home. And then Ethan's like, oh, she likes me. She likes me. And they have this, in a very Edith Wharton way, have this passionate longing for one another, but that doesn't include touching. It includes a lot of long glances. It barely includes speaking. <laughs> it's it's a, lot of, a lot of longing, you know, constant craving as that song went. They're just constantly, they just have each, and it, and it, makes him he feels guilty but at the same time he this is his chance at life and he and we get to the story by the way there's a he gives a ride to the town when he's much older to this unnamed person that's going to the train station every day and they don't have a car or anything so he takes them and one day he leaves a scientific american behind he or she does and Ethan reads it and that's when the person goes oh he's really smart he's really into science he had a whole life that he wanted and he never pursued. I wonder what went up with that. And what he finds out is that Ethan is like Z- Zena realizes what's going on. And so Zena goes to the doctor and then comes back. Well, she rarely goes to the doctor, but she goes to the doctor, comes back. She goes, OK, I have to get a real nurse to take care of me. So Maddie's got to go and it's got to be tomorrow because they're coming. Yeah. Tomorrow. So Zena, it's like her hobby, these v- various ailments that she has. Um, they're different. They, you know, it's not like it's one particular, it's like, oh, she's tuberculosis or something like that. It's like, now it's, now it's my elbow. It's this, now it's that. So she hears tell about this fancy new doctor who's in a neighboring town. So she's going away overnight and, um, leaving Maddie and Ethan alone. Maddie, who we know, which we now at this point, we kind of know that they're both, they both are longing for each other. So Maddie is trying to, again, she's not really, she's not really skilled. (laughs) So she's trying to like fix dinner, um, trying to make it nice for Ethan cooking. Like it's just okay, but she's her best. And she goes and gets the pickle dish (laughs) high up shelf in the closet where um, Zena has hidden it, puts it on the table. So just to make it look pretty, they're sitting at the table. And at one point, I think they both reach for like a milk jug and their hands like graze each other. And like, and there's, there's a cat, they have a cat, the Fromes and the cat is, there's this whole thing about the cat is sitting on Zena's empty chair and they're like, Oh, ha ha. Look at the cat. And they're, they're having like a moment of levity and enjoying each other. And she's singing and humming. And he's like, Oh, this is so amazing. This is so nice. And the cat inadvertently, knocks over the pickle dish. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is hilarious to me because Z- I mean uh, Maddie is Maddie is 
instantly despondent. She is howling with, you know, she's just weeping and sobbing and like, oh, my my life is over. I broke the pickle dish. And Ethan, Ethan I can, it's a glass, there's a red glass pickle dish in the 19th century. So not tempered glass, which means tiny little shards all over the place. And Ethan's like, I can glue it. <laughs> I know. <It's> like, <laughs> don't don't cry. <laughs> Wasn't that in the Brady Bunch? There was the vase that he broke and they were like, oh, we can just glue it back together. <laughs> and then it bursts on them. But he's like, oh, I'll just get some glue. And she's like, dude. no, dude, <laughs> no. <laughs> and also, you have nothing else. She wants, she at least needs Zena like a, for a recommendation to get another gig, right? Like if, exactly. And, and and she's not going to get it now because she's right. just screwed up royally. And she yeah. just, she knows that Zena's going to be upset and going to yell at her and say all these bad things about her. It's going to really hurt her chances. And you know, Ethan, yeah. nice guy, but he doesn't have a lot of drive. There was maybe a chance when Zena leaves for the doctor, like maybe a chance that they might have talked her out of getting this other nurse and kicking Maddie out. Now the chance is gone. Right. It is over. It's gone with the pickle dish. So he considers, let's just run away together, you and me, let's go. And he goes to a customer and asks for an advance. So he at least has some money. So then they can just take off. But then he's so and decent. Also, yeah. He wants some money. Yeah. To leave for Zena as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he realized, want to be a decent guy. He wants to be a decent guy. But he even realizes like when he, the, the, he can't do it. He can't screw somebody over. And then he's thinking like, by the time I raise enough money for us to go away together, like, it's going to be so, there's so much time. You're going to have gone by then. And also she doesn't have any place to go. No. It's not like they're sending her back to her parents. Her parents don't want her back. Um, she is literally being sent out into the cold uh, mass winter with the clothes on her back and nothing else, basically. And so, yeah, it's know, just going be, Zena being, being a B word. She is because it's like a, <laughs> If she couldn't just start feeling like, look, they're replacing me and Zena would be like, yeah, she's good. She's she'll be OK, mate or whatever. She at least has a chance, but she doesn't. So she and Ethan. So he's taking her. She, you know, Of course, Zena finds out about the pickle dish, doesn't handle it well. It really does not go well. No. So <laughs> he's really not. She has no chill about. The no, dish. no, not in a which, forgiving mood. Which we've established. She never uses. Not even when. Uh, the pastor comes to dinner like who who higher up than that in Starkville is going to come to dinner nobody so even for him she doesn't take out the pickle dish um so she's so if that's for the pastor it's not good enough for anybody so the pickle dish she never uses and never will doesn't matter this is the end for everybody as far as she's concerned so he has to take her and the horses in the cart and take her to town. And even then she's like, no, let her walk. And like, no, I'm not going to let her walk. It's like freezing. It's snowing out. He takes her. And then as they're going, they're expressing how much they love each other and they're going to miss each other. Wow. This really stinks. I don't. And he says, do you want to go sledding? Let's go. Let's do some sledding. One last moment of joy. Of pleasure. Before they have to live their rest of their lives without each other. Right. So they go sledding a couple of times and it's so exhilarating. And then she's the one who suggests, why don't we just like go right into that tree? And there's this big pine tree. And he's like, are you sure? And it's like Thelma and Louise, like let's just the two of us clasp hands and go. So he gets into the, into the sled and he says, I want you to sit behind me because I want to feel your arms around this me. This is the fatal error. Right. This is the fatal error. Fatal error. In doing so, he now cannot steer properly. And that's where we, that's, that's, yeah. Well, so they're, they're heading down fatal, the hill. I mean, not fatal. <laughs> uh, not fatal, right. They wish it were, I mean, in that moment, but they, he, so he's in front of her. And then as they're heading towards the tree, he gets a quick flash of Zena's face, like, you know, as guilt or whatever you want to call it. And he just kind of hits the tree, but not really heads head on are a big bloody mess at the bottom of this tree. There's some kids sledding nearby and they can hear them. He can hear the horse freaking out. He can just, and he's in so much pain and he's like, Oh, we're not dead, but we're really banged up. This is bad. 
Ugh. How, well, what what could possibly be worse? This. This. What could possibly be worse than not be, being together? This. And so it's 24 years later, we find out that that's what's going on, is that Maddie and Zena... 24 four years. years. Zena now is healthy enough, but she yeah, has... Yeah, it turns to, out she's actually she's, uh, not as sick, sick as she thought. But she think? has to take care of Maddie, who's incapacitated. She's basically yep. paralyzed. And Ethan can get around, but he has a mangled up right side. Just so, barely. He could just barely get around. Yeah. And, and he a really lot can't of run the farm. You right. Know, like they are, like they were surviving before. Like they're not, the, no. Like there's some charity going on too. Like people bring stuff every now and again. Yes. But, um, they are, be, they're, the three of them are, are recluses essentially. Um, nobody sees the whipper and Ethan is, you know, only comes into town for the absolute necessities. And the thing too, is like the nature of the accident Everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows what was going on, too. So everybody knows their business now. And the, maybe they the, don't um, know about the pickle dish, but they, you know, might maybe as well. not the pickle dish. But then the unnamed narrator is like, "Well, what do we do to help them?" Because they're just hearing this story, and these people say, "Like we used to go more often, but it's so depressing to be around the. It's just filled such a bum out. It's yeah. such a bummer. It's that the room, their rooms are filled with despair. Like it just so people, the church does what they can, like donates money and thing, and checks in on them when there's a bad mm-hmm. storm. But for the most part, yeah." You know, and and they were like, God, what if we only waited a few more months? You know, we, if why couldn't this have happened in the middle of summer? You know, or spring, <laughs> any other time but winter. Seriously, <laughs> and that's the story. That is the story. It's a real bummer. It's, it's and um and they never even like. Do they kiss? I'm not even sure they kiss. If they do, it's like. It's the briefest, like very. It's not like it's not Gene Kelly shoving his tongue down Debbie Reynolds. No, throat. no, no. <laughs> it's it's chaste. <laughs> yeah, it's very chaste. So that's the story. It, it also, by the way, Edith Wharton said she based some of it on what she heard was a sledding accident with a few kids, and one of the kids died. Oh yeah, I know. And so she just like kind of took that and then used that as the metaphor. So anyway, there we have Ethan Frome, and that's nineteen eleven. I have one more thing to say, which yeah. is, if you've not read it, the writing is so good. Yeah. It's it's really, I mean, she's such a good writer. One of the things I think is really, uh, about Ethan Frome in, in particular of her work, is that it is a great one to listen to. It's a it's something about Ethan Frome, it just, it really is, it, it really lends itself to being read aloud. It's that's really good. It is. Yeah. It's just a bummer. It's just it's a super bummer. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of winter, it's fine. I wouldn't. I don't know if I can handle this in the middle. You of will summer. get caught reading it. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. There, and there's several. I mean, Audible, I'm sure has a has a yeah. version, and you can find it on YouTube. Okay, so in lieu of a trailer, we're just gonna do a quick break, and then we'll go right into this 1993 movie that I've never even heard of <laughs> until we did this. Nor had I. This is a Miramax production. John Madden is the director. Oh. I know. <laughs> I know. There's some movie I saw recently that there's like a new version of Miramax that's out and making movies. And I'm like, why do y'all just, you know, get rid of that logo, all of it? I mean, is, what? I can't, I don't, I don't remember what it was, that. but I, was, I know. I was so you can like, call it something else. That's oh. fine. Like nobody's begrudging you going on with making movies. We want without the movies. That jerk. We want the movies. Call it why? Why? I don't know. I, it really. It was. It's some independent movie that I saw. It was a newer film, and I was really like blech when I saw that. Anyway, ninety nineties Miramax, especially early to mid. They were just kind of feeling themselves, but they were like before Pulp Fiction comes out, but they were the place to go for independent movies and movies that had like a 10 million budget or lower. Um, And so it was the we always, you know, we were also so like it was better quality. It was more interesting. They told more interesting stories. You know, 90s are pretty formulaic 80s and 90s movies. It's true. Yeah, they were. And they and they, you know. Was I? Yeah, I was in college, and um, I was in college in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. Um, but I don't remember hearing about this movie. I think I would have gone and seen it. I was certainly reading Edith Wharton in college. 
I don't know. Um, well, but I also, you know what? I also didn't have a lot of money. So I, I also wasn't going to see it to the theater that much. And, and something yeah. like this, I was like, if this came up on PBS, I'd watch it. But I was, mm-hmm. I mean, look, this is the cast. I mean, Liam Neeson, yeah. beautiful, by the way. This is young Neeson. I mean, yeah. Whew, Patricia Arquette, who's wonderful in everything she does. Always so believable. I love her. Me too. Joan Allen, same. Always same. believable. Always. Yep. Yeah. And she plays a me. And then Tate Donovan, who's adorable as the pastor, the new pastor. Yeah. And then Catherine Houghton, uh, she plays Mrs. Hale. It's a good cast. I think they. So it this is, is filmed. Cast. It's filmed in Vermont and it feels cold. I have friends that live in Vermont cool. and the level of snow they get is beyond you can imagine. Like, we don't get really that much snow in New York anymore, but they still get it mm-hmm. up there. It does really capture the feel of the winter in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And supposedly somebody that worked on the set only for like a week or two didn't have the proper gear. And they were warning this person, like, they're probably from L.A. or something. They're like, no, you really need to layer up because it's going to yeah. get cold. And they're like, nah, nah, nah. And then the person got pneumonia. It's like, it's that Ooh. cold. Yeah. It's that cold. It's it looks that cold. That cold. It Ooh. does. So when I was first watching this movie and I started texting Margot because the first I started getting giggle fits because <laughs> Liam Neeson is like hunched over like Marty Feldman in Young Dude. Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's really going for it. it I, I, there's no this, chill. <laughs> and the the book, we should say like the okay. <laughs> It's the 19th century, all right? Now, what did I just read? Oh, okay, that, that, that is not relevant. Um, Ethan Frome, the real Ethan Frome, like it, this guy, if he had lived at the time that he lived, he lived in the place that he lived in a remote little town in the 19th century, you know, turn of the century. Um, if he had had even a slight limp, it would have been enough to make him, you know, an odd fringe probably ostracized a little just for that but like the level (laughs) of i could i i know it's inappropriate i was giggling that's why i started texting you you're like i'm actually going through a thing right now (laughs) not having seen this movie i was you know what i was expecting was was like like a like a hugh laurie as house level limp that's all you need that's really all you need you know that would have been enough for this, for this new stranger in town to be like, oh. And, and like an arm like? in a sling or something, you know? Yeah, you don't want to mess up face. Uh, well, you know, you uh, got you know. Liam Neeson. You don't want to mess up his face. Not too much. But, but um, he's super tall. So they just decided to bend him over like 90 he, degrees. He's, <laughs> so he's, he's like he's about to tie his shoe <laughs> and he's walking at the same time. So weird. I think like. It's pronounced it's Igor. I just couldn't like get that image out of my head because it's so <laughs> ridiculous. Ooh, and somehow Tate cool. Donovan keeps us straight. You know, he's like, oh, what are we looking at here? And everyone's like, ignore him. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But I think before I have any opinion, I- I've only been here a week, Mr. Gow. A week's. Not for anyone, no Starkfield. One day is enough. An hour, maybe. If you spend too much time in Starkfield, you begin to look like a hermit. Just the dumb ones are left, Reverend Smith. The smart ones get away. But the importance of a church, surely, is not the state of the building, but in the spiritual comfort it can offer. Ignore him, which is Nothing, even worse. Fine. Right. Fine. <laughs> He's fine. 
So then they're in the cart and Ethan's walking home like that. And they're in their horse and cart. And he's like, let's give this man a lift. And like, no, he won't take it anyway. No. I'm like, what? Really, though? Because I think if it was that, he would. I kind of think he would. Did you ask him? <laughs> it's, 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 Just prepare yourself. Like, as, like, whatever it is that you're picturing, it's so much more than you're picturing. Right. <laughs> Just like the first 10 minutes of this movie, you're going to be like, it's a what? Lot. It's a lot. It gets better. This but it, like, <laughs> it, it's but it was something. It was a choice that I was like, oh, I wouldn't have. They're trying to Daniel Day-Lewis it. Like, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis would play it's like. totally that. Yeah. You know, actors do that total physical transformation. Daniel Day-Lewis, I mean, listen, I love Daniel Day-Lewis. We do. But he really did a number on uh, some actors for a minute there in the 90s. Yeah. The method acting here and the and also there was a whole thing about if you play a person with some kind of disability, you'll automatically get an Oscar. At least you get the nomination. It's that's a whole thing. Anyway, so he's married to Joan Allen and they really play up more of like a sexual kind of heat between them when she's the nurse for his mother. Which which is okay. Actually I don't mind that. I didn't I either. I thought that was good. Um... Hi, I saw you eating. <laughs> Sit down if you'd like. Make me nervous darting around like that. You can sit on the bed, move some things over. Careful. I'll do it. You just sit there. In that situation, like that, showing their relationship with this, Joan Allen plays his wife, Zena. It shows us, kind of fills in the blanks of what the book is describing, I feel. Because um, you do are, you are kind of wondering, like, wow, like he really, okay, he's going to marry her. All right. Whereas I, I feel like the movie is really showing us, like, yeah, like he's really lonely. They're really isolated. There really isn't anybody else around. Like, what else is he going to do? He's stuck on this farm for the rest of his life. And Doesn't she's he should have a wife? Like, and she's older, and for that time. Yeah, what's she going to do? Right, so you get Where's it. Where's she going? Yeah. And then we have... So, yeah, I kind of thought that was good. Yeah, yeah. And then, so then, she, the, 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 then they've been married for a few years, and that's when she needs help. So then we have Maddie Silver, who's Rosanna Arquette, who's, I mean... Uh, Patricia, excuse me, her sister's Rosanna. Anyway, she's beautiful. She's vivacious. There's something always otherworldly about her, I think. I just love her. I she's so she's always good. So always so good. She's she's perfect as Maddie. I mean, she is that that's exactly what I picture when I when I read that book. Is is it like a like Patricia Arquette, for sure. Yeah. And Tate Donovan, I think, is a great choice as a pastor because it would make sense he would have compassion for this man. Yes, and it makes sense. And, I, and I'm and i not mad at that choice either because, again, that's not from the book. Just a stranger who's stranded there briefly. It, it For the movie, it makes have him be the new pastor. He's going to be there for a while. He wants to know his flock. So it makes sense to me for it to be the pastor. And, I, yeah, I think he does a great job. I, I like the scenes of him... Um, very gently confronting, you know, everybody in the town about like, how did the, you guys let this get to this point? And then we start to learn like what's going on and to see it all come to life. And that know it doesn't always happen when we're, you have an adaptation. I feel like there, it's a decent adaptation. Like it does, I think, bring some of those images to life, the dancing, that whole thing where he's jealous watching I her. That whole scene, I think that's really well done. And it's very true to the book. Yeah, I agree. For the most part, the the movie is again. We have the device of it being the pastor, but you kind of need that um, for this for an adaptation. For the most part, it stays very true, except <laughs> except Weinstein got a Weinstein. <laughs> if he really had his way, she'd be topless or something. Seriously. Like there would be a, a bathroom I was ready for, I was bathing like scene, freeze and fall off of her or something. I don't know. She'll sneeze right and it'll just. Poof. <laughs> Yeah, that's that would have been his touch. But no, that's not what happens. Thank goodness. But they do have like a couple of clinches and they have like these. They have sex. They have. Yeah. They um, seriously make out right before they pickle dish. 
Um, and then they, and then they actually sleep together. Like, no, like the whole thing is like, no, they didn't even do that. And they're, they're like a main plot point of the book. Is I know. That they don't. I think like, I'm sure Weinstein saw the age of innocence and it's like, why didn't he sleep with her? It's Michelle Pfeiffer. You know, I'm sure that's like, like part of it. Ugh, those men. So they do sleep together. He's really, really in love with her. They do have a dinner and there is a cat featured and not her great cooking. And then they break the pickle dish. Joan Allen doesn't appreciate this very much. She she knows what's happening. She could tell, you know, she's not dumb. She, she realizes like what's happening under her nose, goes to the doctor one day, knowing she's going to leave them behind overnight. But she comes back and says, well, I'm getting a nurse and she's coming tomorrow. So say goodbye to Maddie. Flosha went to him and now she's up and around and singing in the choir. I'm glad of that. You just do what he tells you then. I mean to. Says that I should have a hired girl <laughs> and that I oughtn't to have to do a single thing. Hired girl. And Aunt Martha found me one right off. Everybody in Bedsbridge says that I was real lucky to get a girl to come way out here. And I agreed to give her a dollar extra to make sure she'll be over tomorrow afternoon. If you meant to engage a girl, you ought to have told me before you started. How could I tell you before I started? How did I know what Dr. Buck had say? And did Dr. Buck tell you how I was to pay her wages? No, he didn't. For I'd been shamed to tell him that you grudged me the money to get back my health when I lost it, nurse, and your own mother! You lost your health? The and you told me at the time that you couldn't do no less than marry me! You'll have to send it back. The doctor doesn't understand how I've stood it so long, slaving the way I've had to. You don't have to lift a finger. I'll do everything. You neglected the farm enough already. Better send me over to the almshouse and done with it. I guess there's been problems there before now. <coughs> I thought you were getting $30 from Andrew Hale for that lumber. He'll never pay under three months. You told me yesterday that you'd fixed it with him to pay cash down. You said that was why you couldn't come with me. It was a misunderstanding. You ain't got the money. You ain't gonna get it. Maddie is upset, but she's also like, what are you gonna do? I broke the pickle dish. This is... (laughs) She's like, I guess it's, what happens? It's okay. <laughs> so she she and Liam Neeson take off together. They see the mountain for sledding and they head down the sled a couple of times. And then once, like I said, she says, what if we were just to go one more time and just hit that tree? And he's like, okay, but you got to sit behind me so I could feel you embrace me one last time. And right, then, which in the book is the first time. Right, it's, this is the thing. It's like I can actually finally feel your arms around me. Like that's a whole. Like that's such an important part of the story. And now, but they now. Wait. Why, Ethan? I want to go in front. I want to feel you hold me, Matt. so they hit the tree and then we fast forward and then there's tate donovan with uh i think mrs hale and he's outside the house and he's looking in and he gets to go in for a second and then we see maddie and it's 24 years later and she looks really old and she did not age well. And, and they're all stuck with each other. You know, the the, Joan Allen is stuck there. Zena's with them and, and he's stuck with them. So they're all just kind of 
stuck with each other. Mrs. Hale says, look, we, we try to go by a couple times a year just to make sure it's okay, but there's not much we can do. Like, I guess they're just waiting for the roll to die off. I don't know. So there's your fun movie. I know. I know. And there's nobody to inherit the Frome farm, uh, you know. What would they not be that inheriting? Much to inherit. Yeah. I, it's, um, yeah. It's, it's sad. <laughs> it's a sad, it's sad story. Sad. Um, but some of the choices, I just was like, I, the first day that Liam Neeson like walked into camera doing that thing, I was like, how do people not crack up? What, what is this? What is that? I, 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 I. Choices. Choices. (laughs) It's the choices. And I was like, wow. And that's, anyway, that's Ethan Frome. Yep. (laughs) It is hard to get beyond the, what is he doing? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Neeson. <laughs> He's a young I actor. Object. <laughs> I object. It's probably one of his first lead roles. I don't remember him. I, maybe. I don't know. I don't remember either. But I love him in this, you know, the younger scenes, you know, all of that with where we see his relationship develop with Zena, his wife, and then with Maddie. I think that though, that I think he's fantastic. <gasps> Why would you get me something? Yeah, sweet. Dennis Eady asked me to give that to you. (laughs) Sweet. I love sweets. (laughs) They're good ones. I can see that. Take one. You try one. Mmm. Very good. Um, he's a good actor. Throughout all of that, oh, he's a great actor. Yeah, he's a great all actor, part. and he's and he's great in the part. It's just like yeah. one choice that I don't know. Like went through how many people that they decided to do that, and uh, you know, I'm a child. I just started giggling, and then I have to. But I, I, it's beautifully done. I mean, it's it's perfectly fine movie to watch when you're like folding laundry and things like yeah. that. It's, it's perfect for that. Yeah. Um, and be- between book and movie, I'm going to say book. I think. It's... Yeah. I think so too. Um, but I think, yeah, everybody's giving a very solid performance. All of the, um, I like the whole thing about Mrs. Hale, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause, cause Maddie before the accident is, as, as Margot said, is well liked by the, by, you know, she has some friends. Mm hmm. Um, And so Mrs. Hale is her one friend from before the accident who really cares about her and and does go and check on them and, um, and tries to, you know, um, bring them news about what's going on and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I think that's all really great. I think Joan Allen is fantastic. I don't know why we had to, well, I do know why, but um, it adds nothing. It it adds absolutely nothing. The Weinstein um, touches right <laughs> yeah definitely book yeah definitely book same and and you can yeah. stream this anywhere like i said it was very hard for me to find clips maybe one of you will start putting clips up so that, you know video well, clips so i mean i got it's audio because, clips but no because there are no um there is no trailer there must have been a trailer there had to what? have been and i usually and i've done there's no way the, there wasn't a trailer what there's the reason we're not seeing a trailer i'm sure yeah. um, but anyway because there's not and this is very fun because there is not so a book that is assigned in school a great deal. Um, many, many, many high school and college and older uh, students have taken it upon themselves <laughs> to create their own trailer for this movie. And it is hilarious. Um, just go to YouTube sh- or Ethan Frome trailer, movie trailer, um, and you will be amused for a good deal of time. Yeah. Uh, there are some really funny and creative trailers out there for this movie. 
they're people are so creative. <laughs> so funny. It's so funny. I mean, I know like 1993 me, if I were in a movie theater and then he did that, I would be laughing. Like it would be very hard for me to like. <laughs> I think I probably would be too, especially because I would have just read that book. So I have it in my mind. Right. What we're dealing with here. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. And the fact that like the, it's such a long shot in the opening too of him. Like you see like he is way <laughs> off in the distance. He's a little, a little dark circle in the distance. And, and it, 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 he, he just like slowly, <laughs> slow step, drag, step, drag. Um, into stops, I think for a minute, it's a long, long a walk. And, and I mean, and in today there would be all kinds of, I, I'm glad to say, you know, all kinds of looking at like, or is it, you know, an actor with a disability that we can get to, right? That's of course, but no a consultant. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I wonder like, did he walk around like that? In between shots, too, like just to stay in character. I'd be like, I saw one interview where, and he is very young, he's smoking. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and he's talking about how it was very physically, very, very painful. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it had to have been. I uh, bet. It looks painful. It, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I but, see um, the streaming going up because of this podcast. Like, people are like, I need to see this now. <laughs> I need to see this. They're like, what's going on with this movie? <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. There are so many good high school and college spoofs on YouTube. They are so, so funny. The pickle dish. <laughs> what the pickle? Amazing. Amazing. I really enjoyed. Uh, and I enjoyed like watching all kinds of stuff about Edith Wharton. There's so much we could say about her. You know, like the people who spend their academic careers probably studying her. And, and oh, it's- yeah. It's just, yeah, she's an incredible person. And it was, it really was a, an interesting topic. And I'm glad we, we finally got to it. Mm-hmm. Now, we're very excited about next week because it is Black History Month. I have never seen this movie. I think I read the play back in the day. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. But um, we're going to be talking about Fences. Which is the August Wilson play. And the movie is streaming everywhere. We're both really excited about it. And for those of you like, it's not a book. In theater, the script is known as a book. So there, so there. you go. <laughs> <laughs> that will be for the next episode. But yes, please keep sending us your ideas, all those places I mentioned at the top of the show. Again, our email is book versus movie podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You could find me at Brooklyn Fit Chick for threads and Instagram. And that's the name of my site. I'm at Brooklyn Margo for TikTok and for X, Twitter, whatever that is. All of you, thank you so much for, for following us. We really appreciate it. And we'll be back soon with a new episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Book Versus Movie Podcast. We're a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You could find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. You could find us on Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, and Instagram at book versus a movie. Just spell it all out. We have a Patreon page. Type in their book VS Movie Podcast, where you can find eight years worth of shows. You can follow Margot D on social media at Brooklyn Margot and also Brooklyn Fitchick. You can find Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thank you again for listening and please be sure to send along your suggestions for the show. Remember, the book needs to be easy to get your hands on and the movie has to be streaming on a major platform. We will be back soon with a new episode. <laughs>